When you read the European philosophers, what did they say? They often said that Africa had two great civilizations, Egypt in the north and Asia in the south. The white man said this. So they often, in, in ancient times, Asia was considered a part of Africa or Africa's second civilization. They said that you go to Asia and it's nothing but a carbon copy of Africa because it was settled by the Africans. A lot of people don't know that there are pyramids all over Asia and there are pyramids in, in China, in Japan. They have an underwater pyramid that a lot of people don't know about. And you can go there now. And that's one of those ancient mysteries. But again, pyramids are all over the planet. So in, in Asia today, you have pockets of black people. You have the Mani you have in southern Thailand. You have a related group in northern Malaysia, sometimes called Sakai, S-E-K-A-I. You have the Andaman Islanders, and there are at least two groups. One group is called the Onje, O-N-G-E, or O-N-J-E, I think it's O-N-G-E. And another is called the Jawara, J-A-R-A-W-A. -A -A. And then you have black populations in the Philippines sometimes called Negritos or Eta, or I think we should call them Octa, which just means the people. You have a tradition of a similar group in Taiwan. These are the diminutive Africoids. These are the small blacks, similar in many ways to the Twa or so-called pygmies in Central Africa. These are very, very ancient people who left Africa perhaps 60, 70, maybe 100,000 years ago and became isolated. The Padong people, that's a group of people in Asia, and they, the women have these rings that they wear on their necks that's identical to an African tribe of women in East Africa who wear the same type of rings on their necks. So this just shows that the African-Asian connection is still there. They still carry on some of the African cultures and traditions in certain parts of Asia. I once had a professor of mine working on my doctorate tell me that she went to Japan and they went into the mountains of Japan. Now, this isn't a conscious woman uh, by most definitions, but she couldn't wait to come back and tell me this. She said, Umar, I was in Japan. We went up into the spiritual temples of Japan, and we sat down in one of the temples waiting for the priest to come out and teach us a little bit about what they believe and what they stand for. She said, Umar, they walked out of the temples, and their skin was just as black as ours. They had gray afros because they were elders. Now she said the phenotype looked like the modern uh, Asian, but she said the skin was black and they had gray afros, hair standing up on top like Don King. And she said it totally overcame me. They sat down and they began to talk. And she said, I couldn't believe these were black men. They were Japanese, but they were black men. When I went over to Indonesia, I went there at night and I would see billboards of very light skinned Asian Indonesian people. And then when I went to my hotel, I would go and watch these movies and I would see these very, again, light-skinned, pale-skinned Indonesian Asian people. But the next day when I went out into the streets of Indonesia, everybody was either my color or darker. I didn't see one person who looked like these people that were on the billboards and on television. So they would pick and choose and get the whitest looking Asian people to promote in the media over there. And when I walked around Indonesia, I saw people like jet black, dark. I ran into a couple of people with afros. I, I saw one Asian brother, full-blooded Asian guy with an afro, and I had to stop him. I said, brother, where are you from? And the brother was like, I'm, I'm from here, from right here in Indonesia. So that African presence, that African phenotype is still throughout Asia to this day. Look at the Buddha's hair. No Chinese person's hair look like that. The Buddha has knotty hair. Every time you see the Buddha, his hair is knotted. Just a thought. There's a painting called the Nambam painting of the Portuguese when they first go over to Japan. And when you look at this painting, the painting was made in around sometime in the 1500s, and it was the first eyewitness account of what they saw. Many of the Asian people there were dark-skinned, and half the people who were supposed to be Portuguese were dark-skinned. There's a tradition begun by a man named Alexander Francis Chamberlain, at least in April 1914, in a publication called the Journal of Race Development. And I can quote him almost exactly. And he says, and even in far off Japan, 
we can find traces of the ancient Negro. For when the Japanese armies in the 8th century, now here I'm paraphrasing, when the Japanese armies in the 8th century were fighting their traditional enemy, the Ainu, they were led by a famous Negro general named Sakanoye Tamuamararo, and this man became the first shogun in uh, Japanese history. Also in Malaysia, when I went down to Malaysia, I went into the rainforest over there. And it's very difficult to get over to some of these spots. Some of these people there are very secluded. And because they're secluded, they were able to avoid many natural disasters and they were also able to avoid invasions. So they didn't mix in with some of the invading forces. So they kept their same African phenotype. And if you go to Malaysia, there's a tribe called the Batek tribe. And they look like an African tribe. If you go there, they have woolly hair, African nose, lips, everything about these people look like, looks like an African tribe. One of the things we know about white supremacy and light skin supremacy, because even when you look at Asia, even when you go to East India, they practice racism. Why? Because all of these places were colonized by the European and their culture infected the people. So one of the things that they do is they also have a tendency to do what? Hide the darker brother. As a matter of fact, there was an incident that happened with Miss Fiji. Um, they had the Miss World competition, and they chose this woman to be Miss Fiji. And Miss Fiji has more Europeanized features, and the people of Fiji spoke out against her. They weren't really trying to hate on her, but they said, look, this woman doesn't represent us. She doesn't look like us. She doesn't have our nose. She doesn't have our hair. And we're very proud of what we look like, and we want somebody to represent us. Because again, they were trying to use that Europeanized Miss Fiji to bring in tourism and not scare away tourists. But the people spoke out against her. And this just shows that many people around the world, they're proud of their Africoid features. One of the oldest groups of people to inhabit India were a group of black-skinned people called the Dravidians, or the Untouchables. Now, when people think about the history and the culture of India, they oftentimes think of Mahatma Gandhi. And many people give praises and accolades to Mahatma Gandhi because of Dr. Martin Luther King. But what many people do not know is that Gandhi had very racist views towards black people. The truth behind Mahatma Gandhi First of all, I'm reluctant to use the word Mahatma. Mahatma means great soul. And many of my Indian colleagues would say he wasn't even an ordinary soul, much less a great soul. The late great Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. put that picture of Mahatma Gandhi up in his office and said that he got the operational technique for nonviolence from Mahatma Gandhi. It was somewhat premature for the ancestor. Uh, who's one of my favorites, but it was premature because now you automatically set the stage where African people would start looking to Mahatma Gandhi also. For example, last spring, last Black History Month, I was in Atlanta. I went to the Dr. Martin Luther King Shrine where he and Queen Mother Coretta, Coretta are buried, and across the street is a museum. Outside the museum is a lifestyle statue of Mahatma Gandhi. I couldn't believe it. This is a museum dedicated to the honor of Dr. King. But there's no statue of Dr. King outside of a museum erected in his honor. Instead, you have a life-size statue of Mahatma Gandhi. So the message to the child is what? That it was really Mahatma Gandhi who's responsible for you coming through the civil rights struggle, not Dr. King. Now, had Dr. King knew Mahatma Gandhi's true racist thinking and ideology, I'm sure he would have thought otherwise. As a psychologist, you can never know how what's really at the root of somebody's thinking. I would argue that we should never make a hero of any other people. Mahatma Gandhi turned his back on Africans. Even when he came back to India and began fighting, he refused to give support to the African emancipation movements. And on more than one occasion, he had made derogatory remarks about Africans. And we also know the Dravidians of India, the Africans of India who are oppressed, were oppressed, and have always been oppressed in India. There is no record anywhere of Mahatma Gandhi fighting against the oppression of Indians in India who were black, the so-called Dravidians. Why didn't he speak out for them? Why didn't he speak out for, for Africans who were fighting against colonialism? Why didn't Mahatma Gandhi help our brothers and sisters in South Africa? It's because he was a racist like the rest of them. First 
of all, Australia itself is the world's second smallest continent, second only after Antarctica. Um, it's the smallest inhabited continent. The name Australia means Great South Land. And the first people of Australia were the people we call Aboriginal Australians, commonly called black fellas. And of course, you have different names, the Koori, the Guri, the Nunga, and various names. The people of Australia, originally Australia was an African land. In fact, in European documentation, they considered it an African satellite. When they came, when the British came into Australia and began the mass extermination of African people, they were crystal clear who they were exterminating because they said it. And, um, and also we know that right off the coast of Australia was an island called Tasmania, a little island off the coast of Tasmania. There are no living Tasmanians in existence right now. You can't find a Tasmanian man, woman, or child because the British systematically exterminated the entire population. It wasn't until January 1967 that Aboriginal people in Australia were considered humans for the first time. In January 1967, there was a national referendum to decide if Aboriginal Australians should have Australian citizenship. Up to that point, they were officially, and you can document this, classified as flora and fauna and plants and animals. In Australia, they would literally breed out the melanin of the people. You know, they would have these, they would take the children and take them to breeding camps and breeding farms and breed the darker ones and the mulatto ones with white. And they would literally breed the melanin out of these people. The movie Rabbit Proof Fence is about that breeding process, them breeding out the melanin of the Aboriginal people. So it was very deep what was going on over there. You have three major island chains, North Pacific, West Pacific, and South Pacific, Me Melanesia, Polynesia, Micronesia. Melanesia is the South Pacific. Those are, that means the black islands. And the biggest island is New Guinea. Others include New Caledonia, New Ireland, New Britain, um, Fiji, um, the Solomon Islands, Vanuatu, which used to be known as New Hebrides. These are the Black Islands. And the people that I've encountered um, in this part of the world tend to say they come from Africa. People tend to have very, very Africoid features, dark skin, uh, tightly curled hair, you know, large Afros, we call them today. Many of them say they come from Africa, especially in Fiji and also in Buka Island. And I ask the people, where, where do you come from? We come from Africa. And they're very matter of fact about it. Buka, B-U-K, means black skin. And they have the reputation of being the blackest human beings on earth. So quite naturally, that was where I wanted to lay my head. Get images of King Kamehameha, and I know you have. The, who is the what might be considered the founder of Hawaii? It's like the founding father of Hawaii. Clearly, clearly, Africa. One of the most famous Hawaiians is a guy named Duke Kahanamoku. Um, Duke was one of the forefathers of modern surfing, and they would use Duke to promote tourism in Hawaii. Um, they would send Duke to the continental United States to promote swimming in Hawaii and surfing, and Duke had problems getting into swimming areas when he came to the continental U.S. because people thought that he was black because he was so dark, and many of the native Hawaiians, they have that dark, African phenotype. If you go to places like Maui and some of the remote areas of Hawaii, you s they look like black people, just like Samoans. You go to Samoa, they look like black people over here in America. I was, I'm doing an interview, a call-in thing, and somebody called in and says, you know, I'm a Hawaiian. And he says, the problem was you just didn't meet the right people. I said, really? He says, when I was a young boy, my grandmother used to tell me that when Kamehameha was trying to unite the Hawaiian Islands, this is around 1815, 
that he ran into trouble and he sent back to Africa for reinforcements. He said that was a Hawaiian tradition. 